you're not responsible, it was wrong, reach out to me. We'll connect you. I will never see, speak, or hear from Aaron Smith Levin for the rest of my life. I've been raised since the age of four to follow orders, do as I was told, or risk losing everything. If we speak out, that's the only way they're going to get the strength to have the courage to do the same. Why the hell someone has to escape to get out of a religion? I'm so shocked by the evil. This is pure evil at work. some extra Scientology edition. I'm Chris C. You can find me and follow me on the Twitter under Miami Sixth Man. Also, the show, this show, Come Get Some Extra about Scientology specifically, has its own Twitter account now. It's CGS underscore extra. That's at CGS underscore extra. And you can email the show, of course, using CGS here, H-E-R-E, at gmail.com. Um, so much going on uh, that I want to talk about in so little time. Uh, we'll start with, uh, if you're in the Pittsburgh area, my friend Kathy schenkelberg has got her uh, Squeeze My Cans Across America hit in Pittsburgh all the way to the 7th. If you want to catch that show, go to squeezemycans.com for ticket information. It's a great show. I've seen it myself, and yes, I loved it, and I think it's an important show. If you have a chance to see it, you should, um, especially if you have an interest. If you have an interest in this subject, uh, also, so oh god, so much great news recently. Um, well, this isn't great. It's 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 great in the way that it exposes things. But there was a place in Tennessee. It was supposed to be a drug treatment facility, I think, and they found uh, for Scientology, and they found two people held against their will at this location in poor living conditions, and they shut the place down in Tennessee. Uh, You can find it in the news. You can find it in Tony Ortega, that Oregon underground bunker. You get all the details there, and uh, it's not something that – it's not fake news. It's not tabloid news. It's something that actually is is legally documented. You can find police reports on it. It happened. It happened. And this whole thing where there was an FBI investigation people talk about that was going on, they got dropped for some reason. Uh, some years ago, those files, those documents are now available to see. It happened. The investigation happened. Now, what's not clear is why it got dropped, except for there might have been a little bit of concern. This is coming from, I think, one of Tony's sources or something um, from the FBI that the uh, that there was concern uh, that there might have been some tampering going on from within. Uh, and uh, for more details on that, again, because I don't have it right in front of me, and I don't want to just talk out my ass, let's go to TonyOrtega.org. Um, lots of free plugs for Tony today, but he's got all the information on his website, so you might as well go there and read that. I'm just reporting it. It's great news. It's great stuff. Oh, man. I'll tell you, uh, today I've got Lois Riesdorf. You've seen her on the uh, Lair Remedy show, uh, Scientology and the Aftermath. Uh, we get more into her story specifically. Uh, today, talking about her being a Commodore messenger, reporting directly to all Ron Hubbard. Uh, we get all the scoop on that and more. Um, and I'll talk a little bit after the show. I want to talk about some more stuff about this part of the interview. And uh, next week's going to get a little bit heavier. Um, here is part one of Lois Riesdorf. All right, so you uh, saw her talking about her son's issues, uh, uh, Brandon Reisdorf, on uh, Lear Remedy, The Aftermath, uh, last season, on season one. Uh, I have her right here on Come Get Some. Please welcome to the show, Lois Reisdorf. Did I say your name well enough there? Yeah, we usually say Lois at Reisdorf. Reisdorf. Okay, Reisdorf. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Sorry about that, Lois. I should, I should have gone over that okay. before I started recording. But anyway, <laughs> welcome. I'm so happy to have you here. You have quite the history in Scientology. You're like the perfect person to talk to if I want to know this versus that, you know, yesterday versus today. Um, you, you're there through the whole thing. Uh, you grew up, as a, you were born in the Scientology in South Africa, is that right? Yes, yes, I was, yeah. All right, so and, go ahead. Yeah, so, so it was mainly my mother who was involved with Scientology because my biological father um, was interested in the beginning but then decided it wasn't for him. So um, 
so she was the one that actually was a Scientologist, and then they did end up getting divorced in the mid-60s due to the fact of the Scientology connection. Interesting. Okay. Because a lot of people yeah. talk about how this connection wasn't a big... I mean, obviously, there's no denying it's much bigger today than it was uh, back then, but it, it was... Uh, it was enforced back then, and that, this is a good example of, of how it was enforced. Right, and I think really that it started becoming a big deal um, in the mid-60s when he first put out the policy letters about this connection and fair game, and I think there was a year or two where it was pretty heavy, but then he later canceled it. Um, and I think because the PR was pretty bad, and um, I personally feel that, you know, Mary Sue, his wife, was involved with making that less of a problem. And then by the time I got into the Sea Org in the 70s, it wasn't a big deal. And then it seems as though it became, was like reinstituted in the early 80s. It feels like it was something that was to the effect of as necessary, as needed. So if things are going smooth and honky-dory and there's no threats to to uh, the Church of Scientology, then there is no need to enforce the policy. You start seeing threats like Paulette Cooper and uh, and yeah. uh, Mr. Russell. Uh, I forget his first name. Yeah, it's exactly. Possible. <laughs> and, you know, pretty much during the time where I was very active in during the... 70s into up until about 1982. You know, you a, a person who had been declared was was there were hardly any people that had been declared, and obviously I wouldn't have even known these people, like a Paulette Q. Cooper or some other ex Scientologist who was going to the press or anything. I mean, I just had no clue about it. So it it certainly is like a thousand times worse now than what it was. Okay, and you know, I almost think that um, in, in a twisted way from the perspective of Scientology and David Miscavige is with social media, with internet, with media, uh, there, there is more threat than ever before. If you have something to hide, it's becoming more and more difficult to hide, meaning you need to be uh, a much higher need to enforce control over it. Definitely. Definitely. Because if there was some local thing going on in some little city in the U.S. somewhere where someone was making up a big stink and it was in the local papers, it would be confined to that area. It wasn't something, you know, that other orgs or the Sea Org, you know, you would ever hear about. Now, it's all over the place. So definitely, the the control has definitely gotten worse. Okay, and, and you had um, you had a big family down there in South Africa, right? Yeah. So so between my so my mom married my biological father, and they had three kids together. So um, there's me, who is the oldest, and then the other two sisters. The one is helping to run the mission in South Africa. And the third one has been at in Hammett at Gold in, since 1980. Yeah. And um, so, were you close to so them? That and so that biological, my biological father has seen her twice since then. Um, he used to see the other one quite a bit because he's, still alive and in South Africa, but since my whole situation, she hasn't now been communicating to him, and her kids do not communicate to him. Okay, and that's just then, because he's got an affiliation with you still. Right. Okay, go ahead. And then, there's, then my mom married Neville Dory, and they're the ones who started the missions and orgs in South Africa, and both of them are deceased, but they had another three kids. Oh, so wow. there were a total of six of us. Okay. Now, they had those kids after you left for um after you left for Sea Org or before you left to become a messenger? 
no before, but then the 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 number six one is the one that um, was born after I had gone into the field already, and she's actually the one who runs is the like the mission holder of the um, Norwood mission in Johannesburg. Okay, so the family mission still exists down there. Yes. Okay. All right, and uh, L- Levine, is that, am I saying that right, yes. Levine? And uh, yes. Jure? Uh, yes, yeah, now Levine is the one who runs the mission, and Jure, um, the other one who is on the video, she actually is the one who's at Gold Int. Okay, were you close to either of them? It seems like you probably, you, like uh, your sisters, but you probably almost didn't all really know each other so well over time. Well, well, the thing is, is... Um, when Jure came and joined the Seorg, I was still in the Seorg. So I had her, like, under my wing, to say, because my, then my other sister, Dion, who wasn't on the videos, who didn't do any videos, she also came. So I had them under, you know, I was like their mom, almost, like, in the Seorg. So, but then when I was declared in 1982... I haven't, I've seen Jure maybe three times since 1980, and, well, since the time that I left in 82, and then Dion actually routed out of the seal. She just, you know, didn't want to be in it anymore, and she went back to South Africa. So, Jure, I haven't had a relationship with, really. He hasn't had a relationship with the family, really. Okay. But I, by the time I got to South Africa, after leaving the Sea Org, the youngest one was eight years old. So I have been in her life from that, from her being eight years old until just a few years ago. Okay. Is she is she in or? Yeah, she's the one who runs the mission now. Oh, that's right. Okay, I got you. I got you. That's Levain. So, you know, she was definitely part of my life okay. once I left the field and was in South Africa. Okay, we'll revisit but, that. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can yeah, but, but, but Jere is the one that really, you know, even when my mom and Neville were alive, the communication to them was very spotty. It was, you know, we sometimes would go for a year or two without hearing anything from her. Okay. Uh, and who knows? I mean, I've heard stories that she was in the rehabilitation project for, for, you know, sometimes for years at a time. So we didn't know what was going on. She was in, you know, the, the most secret location during those okay. years. So and that, that's hearsay. You don't know, know for sure. Pardon? That would be hearsay, though. You're not sure, you think. You've heard something. Yeah, maybe, I'm, you know. I'm not sure. So so the thing is, is I, from what I've understood, is that she definitely said in the video how <laughs> I wasn't part of the family, but that's just, like, so ridiculous because she wasn't. And well, I was very much a part of the family. Yeah, we're going to jump around a little bit because we, we have to get into the video now. <laughs> we, we got to the video uh, at, at the beginning here. That's good, though. Um, there's something about these videos they put out, besides the fact that they're clearly staged um, and yeah. that they put these family members in a position to say these negative things. Um, I just want to point out a couple things, and, and you know, they sound negative, but it's important to put them out there so you can point out the inconsistencies in them. Because once you point out the inconsistencies in something, you lose the value of this statement. Um, Jure had said in the video that over the course of a year, uh, your youngest youngest son, Brandon, is he your youngest or middle son? No, Brandon's the, the middle son, Okay. Craig is the youngest. Craig's the youngest. Okay, so Brandon supposedly sent 93 threatening emails over the course of a year. Now, that by itself probably is a deflated number, probably an exaggerated statement, all by itself, right? Or am I... Or yeah, would, yeah, you know. exactly. So there was a time when he had his mental breakdown, which was in April of 2016. 
So there was most probably maybe including March. So March, April is when he was having his breakdown. And that is the time period that he apparently sent emails. Okay, so so um, that's what you prior yeah, prior to that he was actually working at the local church. Okay. Here in San Diego. So there was no way that this was going on for a year. Okay, well, this is what's interesting about it. That's what Jure says. In, right. in Levain's video, she says 93 emails recently. In right. the writing on the website, there, there's another piece of this. In the writing of the website, Lois, the document it right above their videos, 93 emails in one morning. That's a lot of inconsistency there in that one page of uh, of hate there. Yeah. So it's and, very clear and, what's happening. And from, yeah, and from what I understand is that because I never read those emails because I wasn't, you know, everything was just so shocking to me at the time. Sure. It was just, I didn't want to read them and see, you know, how crazy he had gone with his breakdown. So... But from what I understand, it was a real short amount of time. Okay. It, but my point is that I'm not even focused on, and, you know, maybe it's a little disturbing, sure, 93 emails. I'm not even focused on that part. I'll focus on the fact that this site, pretending to be able to tell the truth and give you the honest look at what's happening, is giving you three different stories on one web page. Yeah, that is crazy. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. Now... Furthermore, in Jure's video, her statement about you is that um, this was all you, okay? So they never wanted to not be a family with you. They never wanted, they never not wanted to be united. This was your doing. You didn't want to have anything to do with them. If you watch Levain's video, she says, it was all us. We didn't want anything to do with her. Again, they're conflicting statements. Um Right. There, there was more to it, but those are the things that really stood out to me about that. People can see for themselves and maybe have a good, you know, it's kind of sad, but you can have a good laugh at it, too. It's um, very, it's almost comical how much they don't have their, they don't have their act together trying to put together this hate video. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and then, you know, I don't really talk, I don't really have a lot of notes on Craig's video. And we'll come, we're going to come back to the Craig video, but, but it's just overall... Craig's video, there was nothing really a substance to it that I can point out to. It almost sounds like a frustrated teenager. I know he's not even a teenager, but a frustrated teenager that wasn't getting his way. And somebody uh, took him under their wing and said, hey, I'll tell you how to get out of it. And gave him advice, and that advice manifests itself in that video. And, and we'll come back to that. Because uh, that's, that's important okay. to come back to. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so going back. You got a chance and an opportunity to go aboard the Apollo. How did that come about? Well, um, we signed, my parents and I, because I was the only one who was older than 12 out of the kids, we signed our Sea Org contract in 1972 when they were still running their mission in the city of Durban in South Africa. And... Um, a sealed mission had come to recruit us, but my parents actually had to, like, find someone to take over the mission, so there was this gap of time before we actually left to go to the sealed. And, um, you know, at the time, I mean, when you're a 12-year-old and you have your parents telling you, and you, you hear these missionaries come from the sealed telling you how incredible everything is to go into the sealed and what you're going to be doing, and you're clearing the planet. I mean, I was just totally enthralled. And um, so basically in 73, then we, we went over to Europe, to Copenhagen, which is where, the, you know, the AO, the Advanced Org, and St. Hill for Europe was. And my parents were both trained auditors, so it was, you know, they were a prime target for them and and if I remember correctly you know you were promised that you yourself would be able to go up the bridge and with my parents at the time they had five kids and very strapped for money um, they 
you know, their future just running the mission, they, there was no way that they could see that they would be able to go up the bridge. But if you joined the Sea Org, you would be able to get that for free, you know. So mm -hmm. that's what was the carrot, I guess, for them. Now, you hear about people in the Sea Org today in modern Scientology not having time really to do their studies with all the, the well, labor. Even, yeah. But even then, even then you didn't. Yeah. So well, that's what I was going to ask you, yeah. Nonsense. Yeah. It, it, you know, I was, I think I was a, if, if you could say lucky, but one of the few that was able to, to do that. Um, I got up to OT3, but um, for most people in the field, even then you didn't necessarily get up the bridge. Well, that seems like pretty far, yeah, for for that. Um, yeah. So, so, I, I, and and at that time, the seal would take children, and so I was thirteen. I just turned thirteen, and then the next one was nine, and then eight, and then four, and three. Oh wow. Yeah. So it was. Yeah, it was. So anyway, we got to Copenhagen and started in the field. That's what we did. And then well, I got recruited separately to go to the Apollo. And a the, little time later a mission came from there and they were looking they were looking to recruit our on Hubbard messengers. So I was just like a perfect age, perfect you know, born in Scientology and and I couldn't stand Copenhagen. I actually hated the field there. And so I really thought that the Apollo was, because L. Ron Hubbard was there, was going to be the best. Right. Let me ask you, uh, were the three-year-olds, because you hear this, uh, were the three-year-olds doing the same work that the 13-year-olds were doing? No. They were, the, the three- and four-year-olds and were in, like, a, a nursery. Okay. And, yeah. And at some point, they decided and, and that the wasn't seven, good. And the, yeah. Yeah, and the eight and nine year old were like the three of us older ones would go to school to an international school, um, and which was run out of a house somewhere in Copenhagen. And then we would come back, and I was definitely had a post, you know, like a job, but I don't remember those two specifically having jobs. Okay. So uh, you had this tremendous opportunity uh, to go on the boat with the man himself, all around Hubbard. This had to have been like an exciting honor to you, is that right? Or, or what was going through your head? Oh, totally. I was completely honored. I just thought it was amazing. Now, by then, had, yeah, had you heard the Xenu story? Because you said OT3, but I wonder what you I just like to get reactions to it. Um, what was going through your oh, mind no, at the time? I, I had no clue about it. Or you got to it, but you didn't. you didn't actually perform it. You didn't actually get to do it yet. No. Um, so what happened was was that, first of all, in those days, nobody would ever speak about OT3 and what it included. Um, so I had no idea. It was in 1980, I was able to go, you know, I actually did the levels to get to OT3, and I did, you know, I sat down and read what he wrote. So, and then audited myself on it. So I had no clue up until that point about that. Okay. But he, a couple of years, I think if you remember reading my blog, there were a few years before that where he had written the movie script Revolt in the Stars. Okay. So that movie script did cover most of the OT3 materials, the story, and in fact, yes, there was Zenu in there, but from what I understood when I typed, because I typed that script, it was a story. Like, I didn't type it thinking, oh, this is what Scientology is about. I read it from the point of view of this is his science fiction movie that he wants to make. Right, a more, more L. Ron but, Hubbard genius. Yeah. Right, but... <laughs> But in the script, there was nothing about the BT. Hmm. Which is 
only when I went got onto the OT3 materials was that there. Okay, so you know it was gonna so, make a public yeah, trip. So you want that to be not leave out the stuff that's you know crazy that would point back right, to the religion. So, yeah. Yeah. So when I was reading the OT3 materials, I was going, "Oh my God, this is the story that I typed the Revolt in the Stars movies." Except there was this BT and cluster thing, hmm. which wasn't in the movie. Wow, that movie never got made, right? Uh, clearly, no, okay. no, never got made. What a great tragedy! Uh, <laughs> so you, you were around Elvon Hubbard quite a bit. You got to be his messenger. Now, now before before I get to this, that's we really want to talk about Elvon Hubbard, but. Getting on the boat was it was that what you expected the boat to be, or were you expecting like a luxury ship type of uh, experience? You know, I can't remember what I thought. I just remember I I do remember that I arrived on the dock in Lisbon, and it was late at night, and I remember standing on the dock just thinking that this was such a huge ship. Um, I actually thought that it was going to be smaller. I didn't realize that there were that many people on board. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. All I, all I can remember is just being horrified at, as to where I had to sleep and stuff. It was just awful. Okay. And I cried, you know, like for the first few weeks of, at night. Did you get upgraded rooms when you got to be messengers directly under um Yeah. Oran? So... So when, when you became a senior messenger, then you got a cabin with another messenger. So there were just like two of us, and that was like amazing. <laughs> and it's, I bet you it still wasn't amazing to today's standards of, of boat oh, cabins, no. but for, for what you had before, right? Yeah. And I remember this, this other thing that happened, which I didn't bring up in my blogs, which was um, you had like these these showers, so it wasn't like you walked into a big, huge bathroom where there was a lot of showers. They were just like a door, and you open it, and it was a single shower, and then there could be another one next to you. Um, and I remember that they were made of, like, steel. The inside of it was made of steel, but that what would happen <laughs> is that there would be holes, mm. little holes. And so if there was a guy uh, in the shower next to you, <laughs> he could peep in to oh, through the hole. And like in the beginning, you didn't know this, and then you finally realize it. And then, so we'd get our, our bar of soap when we get, immediately got into the shower, and we would plug up all the holes, you know, before taking our towel off and turning the water on. Smart. <laughs> wow. It was crazy. Was there no punishment for that type of behavior on there? No, because you didn't really know who it was, and you saw eyeballs. We didn't write knowledge. We didn't write knowledge reports like what it's like today. What, 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 do you think some think, of it? Go ahead. No, I just don't think I've ever written a knowledge report on anyone when I was in the field ever. No, but that was something, um, do you think it was different because it was all around ship? Do you think just things were just different? Yeah, I, you know, um, I know that he's written all the policies and he's given all the orders, basically, that everybody's running off of today. But um, he himself didn't adhere to those policies to, to a T, you know? Which is one of the it's, things that cult experts will tell you is, is kind of a cult leader would, would do. Yeah. But you, you so, reflect on him fondly, it seems. Well, well, the thing is, is that I, you know, since I've, since I've been reading everything on the Internet about him and his history and everything, it's, it's really shocking to me. So... I, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's almost like finding out that your grandfather was a pedophile or something, you know. Right, something, you never expected like it. You really yeah. loved, like you really loved this grandfather and you had great respect for him and then 
since he's died, you've found out all this horrible stuff that he was involved with, and it it kind of takes a while for it to sink in, you know? Right, because you're only exposed to so much of them. You're only exposed to that one side. And I feel like the messengers, just from your description alone, I don't know much about it, but just from reading the blogs on Mike Rinder, uh, Mike Rinder's blog site that you wrote, um, it, felt, it seems to me like on the boat you had to act kind of like family or else you aren't going to make it. You know, So it had to be a different atmosphere than most other locations like back before you got on the boat you know, in the Sea Org. Oh, definitely, and I, and you see, most pr- practically the whole time that I was in the Sea Org, I was in that small community with him. So, and and once we even got on into the U.S., it even became smaller until eventually, towards the end. But for most of my time, I was exclusively with him in secret locations. Once we even got off the boat. So I feel as though I had a, a more privileged, sheltered experience in the Sea Org than most people even during that time. Oh, no, I mean, while you might get yelled at more, which I understand he yelled at some people, but while, right. you, while you might get yelled at more, you're also, you also have more benefits to being there. Exactly. And then, like Gary, my husband and I, we would talk about the times when we were in the, the gold in space, w- which still exists near Hammond. And we were think we, we were remembering the days when we didn't even have fences up. We didn't have security guards. Maybe there was one security guard that was on watch during the night. Um, but you know, we would finish work like say on a. Friday morning early because we had been doing the set all night on a Thursday night, right? Because that's set day. Okay. And and so maybe it's like two o'clock in the morning and we finally finished everything. We've answered telexes all the way back to flag and wherever. And then we would all pile into a couple of cars and we would go to a local Denny's or Sandy's or truck stop off of the I-10, and we would go and sit and have, the guys sometimes would have a beer, and we'd have a share, whatever. Yeah, unheard of. <laughs> unheard of stuff. And, and, yeah, and that was even with David Miscavige, you know, like, he was junior to me at in those days. So, we just had that kind of a, a life where things were not run so crazy like it is. So, you described in your blog a few things about how, uh, a few misnomers about about L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, you pointed out, uh, first of all, you don't think he was injured in war because you gave him uh, shoulder rubs and back rubs where there were no scars or no, yes. no injuries showing there. And you also mentioned he may have been a bit of a hypochondriac. Um, you mentioned that, uh, that people were waiting on him hand and foot, people handing him his pipe, lighting his pipe bringing him drinks, giving him rubs. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe he wasn't injured in war and maybe he wasn't even a hypochondriac, but if maybe he had muscle atrophy because he never lifted a finger to do anything. I always wonder. That's, yeah, uh, you know, the thing is, though, is, you know, like he would take his walks around the ship and then later he, you know, he walked and he would do certain things, but it wasn't definitely, he wasn't like an active person, but he did have a muscular body. You know how mm-hmm. you can get a guy who can be pretty big, but it's not necessarily just like a flabby fat? Right, it's almost a natural muscle. Was, yeah, like he had a natural muscular type of body, so um, he, he, he definitely wasn't you know, and, he, and you could see the muscles in his legs and arms and stuff. So I don't think he had that. I don't think he had a muscle. <laughs> okay. I was trying to be funny. Atrophy. I was trying to be funny. But the, the, the um, well, other thing you pointed out is that he didn't seem to have uh, tendencies of womanizing or of pedophilia, any of that stuff people talk about. Um, you wanted to clear that up about him. 
But I do think it's interesting and strange that he's got 13-year-olds giving him body rubs. But, I mean, I don't know if that struck you as a little bit odd. Yeah, but, you know, he was sitting on the side of the bed, and usually Kima Douglas was there, or, Mm -hmm. you know, an adult, another adult. Yeah, I'm not trying to make it something and, that's not. I'm just saying. <laughs> and 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 another messenger or two. So there okay. was very few times that there was like a single messenger with him in his bedroom. Okay, I, I just I just wanted to bring that up. I mean, I think it's a little odd, but I'm not trying to make it something it's not. Clearly, you didn't witness anything yeah. like that. I, I don't know that I he ever did anything like that either. But. Yeah, and and I certainly didn't ever feel that stuff like like you know being in the presence of someone but feeling like not feeling that lecherous that lecherous feeling. Yeah. 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 I never I never experienced that. Okay, well that's good. That's good. I mean, no no one said he had to be a pedophile, but I mean, there's uh, things he wrote points to allowing it and being okay with it, but that doesn't mean he was, and that's important to clarify, of course. Um, yeah. One thing I found interesting, you talked about in your blog and you're talking about it in this interview, is how you were going to various locations undercover. You knew that you were hiding. You knew that you guys weren't to be detected, right? Right. Did that bother you? Did you wonder why you would have to hide with the the leader and the founder of the most ethical religion on earth? Well, I think, you know, one has to, first of all, I was extremely naive. Um, I, the only, the only information or in data that I had in regards to governments and FBI and CIA or whatever was from the, you know, stuff that I'd read as part of courses in Scientology. I and, and I wasn't American, so I had no clue about the American government or anything. I mean, the first time I was probably ever heard of the FBI or CIA was when I was in the Sea Org in mm. relation to reading his policy letters where he talks about them. Yes. So, to me, they were evil. Right, so you say there must be a good reason why we're hiding. We're hiding from these bad people trying to stop us from saving the world. So that's pretty much, exactly. you know. Exactly. I mean, I, you know, obviously now when I look back on it, having the wisdom that I have with from being in my mid fifties is, I look back on that person who I was, and I'm going, wow, just I was clueless. Well, the true irony is there's plenty of people, tens of thousands of people right now, maybe thousands only of people right now who think the same exact way in 2017. So you're not alone in that. That's not, you know, you don't have to feel bad yeah. about that. Right. And and the other thing that I tried to say in my blog as well is that, you know, I grew up in a South Africa, apartheid South Africa, where we didn't even have televisions in the whole country. So... I mean, I honestly had never heard of the Vietnam War until I got onto the ship. Wow. Kind of kind of somebody because from where you're from, the perfect person, the perfect candidate to be in the messenger's office. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was, and the funny thing was, was that amongst our group of people, friends that, you know, the mess, other messengers and other people who were our friends on the ship always knew that I was the real naive one, and I I got teased, you know. <laughs> Cause right. I didn't I didn't even swear, like I didn't even understand swear words. Wow, I can imagine that. So, that definitely. Yeah. So so someone would say a dirty joke, and I would laugh always at the like the wrong time because I didn't understand what the hell they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> so um. Yeah, I was I was definitely very naive. Okay. And what were the conditions like before you? I mean, I'm jumping back around, kind of jumping around a little bit. But back at the uh, the base before you left on the ship, what was it like at that location? Was that like how you hear about Sea Org today, or uh, how can you describe the the arrangement there? The, From the best of your recollection. Yeah, Copenhagen. That's right. 
Yeah, it was it was very bad. I mean, the food was bad. The you know where people slept was bad. In fact, where my siblings were in the nursery was kind of like a basement area, and both of those two siblings of mine who were four and three at the time both have suffered from like things like asthma and, and pneumonia and bronchitis, chest problems throughout their life. And when I look back at what the, where those kids were all day, no wonder. And yeah. sometimes into the night, it's a no wonder. Like seriously, that and and I'm a real estate agent, so I know all about mold and things like that. So I think back on it and I think, oh my gosh, those yeah. two kids were seriously in in such a bad place and um, not getting good nutrition. And and I personally hated it. I seriously hated it. And I just think that the opportunity to go to the, the Apollo was was my way out of it. You know, yeah, into the out of the out of the frying pan into the fire kind of thing. Um, right, but but it did end up being better. You know. I, I, I feel like the, the outer field bases were in bad shape. Now, um, there's talk about how... I'm trying to see if, I have, if I'm in no tray here. Because I, I, I read your blog twice, and I have sometimes trouble recalling things perfectly. I don't want to misspeak, but... Um, did L. Ron Hubbard, when he was angry at people, sometimes refer to them as Nazis? Were you called a Nazi um, and mistreated at some point, or somebody that who who did that? Maybe that was David Miscavige. No, said one. you know that was what I think you're thinking of is when I was. It was my original declare order in 1982, and I don't have that, but I do remember that there was a reference in it saying that I was like a Nazi. Okay. And. So that was the, the, inference, okay. the inference about that was that I followed orders, you know, like a, a normal Nazi person did. Interesting. Okay, yeah. that's a weird, that's a weird, weird statement. It, that's probably why I yeah, it down. Was, yeah, but but no, that wasn't a normal thing that he would say. How hard was it for your uh, mom to not be able to come to your wedding? So, so let's put this latest out for the listeners. You got you met Gary when you were out there uh, with Aura, and you you guys got married, and, and Aura helped you out with the wedding and everything. But you couldn't have your mom there because you were hiding with him. Is that is that what I'm saying that right? Right. Yes. Well, that had to be difficult for uh, even your mom, right? Did she yes. did she just understand that this is important to Alron, so she just went along with it, or does she want to oh, break yeah. the rules, she, or is she hoping to make it? No, she she definitely understood a hundred percent. Um, she was, you know, she would never have questioned it. However, um, I do know that she did like a mock wedding in South Africa with um local Scientology friends. Okay. Without us there. That's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She should have just waited until you get... Okay, well, who knew, who knew how long you'd be in hiding? Uh, who, who knew how long that was right. going to last? Now, you showed a great amount of regret over the next thing we're going to talk about. Um, okay. Instead of a lot, I think you know where I'm going with this. You mentioned them earlier. You are the woman. You are the one who recruited David Miscavige. Is that right? Yes, so, yeah, so he had already joined the SEALG. Okay. And he he had already gone to, to FLAG in Florida, and from what I remember, he was, he was on the tech training call, which is where they make higher class auditors. So he was already an auditor. He had been recruited to FLAG and was now going to be full-time training most probably up to like a class 8 or class 12 auditor and um, we heard about him the CMO the commodore's messenger we heard 
Because we were always on the lookout for, you know, kids that would qualify to be in our organization. And he was one of them. And that's when I met him and his dad in the Fort Harrison. And we, like, did an interview about him joining the CMO. And then he, then we got him into the CMO in Clearwater. And he then did all his basic stuff, most probably over the next six months. And then he came and joined us out in um, La Quinta, which was the base that we had at that time. Now, it sounds to me from the things I read that, that he didn't get along with everybody so well. He kind of did things his own way. Well, um, I have heard stories of when he was in Clearwater prior to coming to us. There were a few instances of him being, um, you know, otherwise, I guess. But once he came to us, he was at the bottom of the, the ladder as far as being in our organization or being a messenger. So, you know, he was on good good behavior, I guess. Okay. Because we didn't, you know, he was definitely, he definitely had a few characteristics, you know, that you could, that sometimes you could see that were like, hmm, like questioning your mind a little bit. But most of the time, I got on well with him at that time, so I can't deny that. That's interesting. This has occurred to me. I, I, don't, I don't know. that it, it really depends, I think, on personality. Is it possible that if you ended up uh, being even closer with Orion and following him closer and rising up the ranks, do you think you could have ended up in David Miscavige's position? Or do you think that only happens because he grabs it and takes it while no one's looking? Yeah, I. you know, I don't think I would have necessarily possibly um my one of my sister in laws, you know, they were that's Gail and Dee who were also, you know, kicked out and stuff. So, um I don't know. I don't think I'm tough enough to have been able to have gotten to that position. I was close but not <laughs> It probably wouldn't be recognizable today. <laughs> Scientology. I imagine. Oh, it 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 would be completely different, believe me. But the point is, is that I don't want to try and toot my own horn here by saying that because I just think that um, regardless of anything, I I have been too much of a nice person through my life. I'm just saying that I think. In order to have taken over the church and you can't be a nice person. Run it. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I just don't think that it would have happened. Gotcha. Of that. I gotcha. So you know? it's only going to happen if someone like him comes along, ready to take it and do what he did. Um, right. And that's that's how that went down. Okay, so we're gonna stop there for today. Um, so, uh, remember next Thursday, I'm going to do a show, uh, with, uh, some hashtag friends. Uh, we always have fun when we're together. It's a funny, uh, fun little podcast we did. Um, and on Friday will be part two of this podcast. Um, it gets a little heavier. We talk about David Scavich's rise, uh, to the head of Scientology. Um, and also we talk a lot about the disconnection that happened within her family and, uh, Lois will have. Uh, a message for her family at the end of the show as well that hopefully they'll get to hear. So it's another show you guys are going to want to grab the link to whenever it comes out and make sure everyone who can possibly see it sees the link, just like with Mary Khan's show, just like with part two of that one, uh, just like with uh, the show uh, Phil Jones was on uh, with Tony, uh, my Tony Ortega part two, like Tony Ortega part one when I had Lori Hodgen flutters. These are the ones you want to get out there for everyone to hear. Um, because of these uh, these messages to the disconnected family members, um, there was something that wasn't brought up in this in, in this interview that would have come up in this part of the interview. Uh, we talked about off air. Um, Lois said we could talk about it. I just chose not to. 
uh, and I'm not even going to get into it here. I'm just going to say there were some parts of the smear videos, the smear campaign against Lois and Craig that um, that got real personal and really twisted. And the explanation uh, that Lois gives is that there are times in sex checks where you say whatever they want to hear uh, during sex checking uh, just to get out of it. And what happens is you end up admitting to things, terrible things, that you've never done. And then those things that you never did are used against you in smear campaign videos later on and presented to your family members. Look what your dad said. Look what your mom said. Um, This is also evident in the case of Amy Scobie. Um, As you know, uh, the smear video out for Amy Scobie is about how she lied under oath. And it really seems – I haven't pieced it together yet perfectly – but it does look like, based on the book, uh, Scientology Abuse from the Top by Amy Scooby, which I am currently in the middle of, right smack in the middle of, it does appear uh, that she was in a case where she was being sex checked and just saying whatever they wanted to hear to get out of there. So I think what we're seeing in this twisted edited up video on Amy Scooby, just like in these twisted, inconsistently put together videos against the various doors. Um, is that she's admitting to lying in a sex check, not admitting to lying about everything else, and that um, and that she used to say, oh, she's a liar, or nothing she says can be trusted. Um, it's sick, it's demented, and it's terrible. And that's that's uh, I mean we're seeing evidence of this as we go through and, and learn these things. Uh, next week again, part two of Lois, and after part two of Lois' uh, resource story, uh, stay tuned. I'm going to give you a little heads up on the next guest. And it's going to be another deep one, guys. Uh, so uh, be prepared. And uh, until then, until next week, uh, stay connected. That about sums it up. Take care, everybody. You have been listening to Come Get Some Extra on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, YouTube, and many other streaming services where available. As always, stay connected. And that about sums it up. <laughs>